meeting of the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake City. We appreciate your joining us today. We'll begin this afternoon with uh, general comments to the board. I have one card, um, and if anyone else would like to speak to us, feel free to give that to me. George Chapman, you know the drill. Come on forward, and you have two minutes to share your thoughts. Okay. You pop up the mic and say your name for us. Thanks. That's the first time anybody has ever said I don't speak loud enough or implied that. Okay, um, with soft. Let's talk about Rio Grande Street because it's RDA territory and actually you are impacting the RDA development of Depot District significantly by putting a fence around there or agreeing to put a fence around there and using an ID card. People that are homeless are going to go outside of the area and avoid it if there's a fence there with an ID card to uh, go to services anytime they want to do anything that's maybe possibly criminal. So that means everybody surrounding that area, depot district, west side, east side, uh, ballpark, everybody's going to be inundated by people that are homeless that might engage in something questionable. That's not right. You also have a chance here. Um, You've never had a chance like this before. Greg Hughes wants to win, and he thinks to win he needs Rio Grande Street. You have leverage. You should be negotiating this. He doesn't have treatment beds, and you can get treatment beds by forcing him, hopefully, negotiating. I mean, you have nothing to lose by doing this, by trying to get him to pass Healthy Utah and get his treatment beds that he says he's been promising for two years. So I'm asking you not to just rubber stamp the approval for Rio Grande Street. Push for Healthy Utah Say, If you want the street, let's pass Healthy Utah, get the treatment beds. So I also want to point out that a couple uh, last year, I asked you to check out Pier 90 in San Francisco. They did the same thing. It failed. I was wrong. In three months, they had to close it because the homeless actually avoided the area. They actually went into other areas more. And that's what's going to happen in Salt Lake City. It's already happening. Again, you have a chance. The only reason to close Rio Grande Street is to Greg, give Greg Hughes a win, and you should require Healthy Utah before he does that. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Come on forward. Bernie Hart, and afterwards, will you fill out a card for us? Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bernie Hart, Salt Lake, and thanks for giving us this opportunity to speak. Uh, I've spent some time, we started a second Tai Chi program down in front of the road home about a month and a half ago, so we've been spending time down there. And uh, there's a lot of confusion and insecurity and people don't really know. It doesn't sound like people have, uh, speaker use has taken the time to converse with the people that this is impacting the most. And um, it bothers me. And what really bothers me is that um, I have a strong feeling that the whole thing is going to fall apart. We're putting the cart behind the, in front of the horse. We're doing driving people out of the Rio Grande, Grande area without having a plan for what's going to happen other than we have treatment centers coming online down two years down the road with a reduced number of beds that are supposed to solve this, miraculously solve this problem. I ran a few numbers on Operation Diversion, which is being touted as the model for all this function, this dysfunction in my mind. And the success rate, when you take into the rate of relapse uh, on people that went through the program, is that they, they will be lucky to have on the 68 people one person succeed in staying off drugs for a, a, an extended period of time. That's one, and that translates to about 1.5 persons per 100 per treatment, 100 treatment beds. So I did a little math, and I came up with the uh, idea that there, well, one of the things I considered was that there has been 350 overdose deaths in the state of Utah last year, and we, and some of the, and we rate pretty high in the country on uh, opiate and drug overdoses. And to deal and to get treatment beds in place at the rate of 1.5 percent success rate per per 100 beds, we would need, considering a bed is occupied at least twice a year for a five month training, we would need approximately 30,000 beds. 
to help 450 people stay off drugs. 30,000 beds. The money for social workers and treatment people, we would need 30,000 beds to attain a rate that started to impact the drug situation related to homelessness in Salt Lake City and the state of Utah. We need to have a discussion. We need to have a talk on what's happening here and what our projections and what our thoughts are because this is mystical and magical, the mathematics and the numbers that are being applied to this problem in the hopes of solving a problem that's only impacting right now the Rio Grande area but is starting to impact our whole community. And if these numbers hold true or even close to those numbers, we're gonna be dealing with an even worse problem once we reduce the homeless beds. So well, I'd like to start a discussion. Thank you all. Thank you very much yeah. for being here. We appreciate that. And if you'll fill out a card, that'd be great. And there's one right there. Anyone else that would like to comment to the redevelopment board? All right, then um, we will move to item B on our agenda. And that is approval of the minutes. So moved. Uh, discussion. Um, let's have a second and then we can have a discussion. Is there a second on, okay, any discussion? Sounds like there is. Yes, please. I just wanted to, um, I'm, having a tr I'm tr having trouble opening my notes here, but on the item that, thank you, the, the public market feasibility study, it notes that we have a couple of requests out to the staff, but I, I didn't really feel like this, these minutes captured the, um, the sentiment of the board, uh, maybe the division between our interest in, in the feasibility study and pursuing this. Um, I know that we didn't take a vote, I, but I also felt like the um, inaccuracy in some of the projections that led to uh, the financials being removed from the discussion wasn't represented in the minutes and though they seem like important pieces of that discussion so uh, I guess I'll ask my peers if we're interested in amending the minutes or not and what what would the amendment be I think um, because we didn't vote on our appetite to continue or anything like that, that perhaps our, the sentiments might not be um, as critical to include, but maybe we're, you would be interested in doing that or somebody who wants to talk about that. But the um, lack, the withdrawal of the financial information was a pretty significant part of the feasibility study that we didn't get to address, and I thought that should be included. How do we how do we do that? <laughs> yeah, I um, agree. But one, I know how to do it. two things. One is that we've been notified that the audience can't hear. So if you could just make an effort to speak directly into your microphone. And the other one thing you could do is just ask the city recorder to go back, listen to that conversation again, and um, sort of beef up that section, so to speak. Yeah, to capture. They're always willing to do that. Thank you. So with if I need to phrase with, that. With that request, um, that formal request to the recorder to make sure it's clear that um, we had concern that we were lacking s numbers that were cl um, workable and that we felt like it was a very incomplete report for us to make any decisions about it. Um, if we can get that. Yeah, they'll go back and okay. listen and, and just listen put to it. more in. Okay. And, and you don't need to act on the minutes at this time. They'll appear. Uh, next time. Okay, and then we will. Um, so, do we need to withdraw the approval of the minutes? I Katie, think do you we know? Can just not act. We, on okay, it. just not. We just won't vote on them. Okay, all right. Then we will table that until next time. And with that, we'll move to item two on our agenda B two RDA capital improvement projects briefing and. Um, board members, this is not intended to be a big in-depth briefing today, but what I would ask as we um, go through, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask, Ben, if we can go through each area and, and highlight the questions that you gave us in your excellent 
staff report and board members if you have uh, additional questions that we would like answered for the October meeting uh, raise those at this point and with that um, if you will both say your names into the mic so those in the audience and viewing at home can know who you are thank you Ben Ludke Salt Lake City Council staff Danny Waltz redevelopment agency chief operating officer and just a quick intro before we jump to attachment two um, the board was first briefed on the RDA capital projects back during the annual budget and the board decided to include the RDA capital projects in the larger CIP discussion this fall which is why we're talking about it today in September the next briefing is going to be October 10th and as the chair mentioned this is an opportunity to highlight any questions that the board wants to add into attachment 2 which was sent to the administration Wednesday last week the table on page one and continued to the top of page two of the staff report summarizes the RDA capital projects by project area and it compares last fiscal year to this fiscal year and you'll notice the totals are there's a big difference because last year it included the 17 million for citywide affordable housing and we inadvertently left off the four and a half million for neighborhoods of opportunity affordable housing. So when you look at the $6 million figure this year compared to last year, it's the affordable housing money that accounts for that big swing in amounts. The questions in attachment two, we can start with number one, the downtown placemaking incentive program. And to my knowledge, this is a this would be a new program. I don't recall seeing it before. And the questions we asked the administration were, how did they determine the dollar amount? Are there specific projects that they have in mind? And if this is going to be coordinated with the three and a half million dollars in parks impact fees that the council appropriated last year to create a new park in the downtown area. Any uh, further questions on? I do. Uh, that area, yes. Board Member Mendenhall. I don't have our, um, our general budget in front of me, but we do give a pretty significant amount of money to the Downtown Alliance for placemaking activities. And I wondered if, um, if these placemaking incentive program would be conducted through the Downtown Alliance or the Chamber, and or if the city would be uh, working that programming and how it overlaps or uh, whether it's redundant with what we're already investing through the Downtown Alliance. Can I add to that question? Sure. Uh, and how that ties into the cultural core, which is also an arm of the Downtown Alliance. We'll follow up. Follow up on that, okay. Yeah. The next one is downtown housing. This is a request for $3 million in the central business district. And we asked if this is gonna be coordinated with the 21 million, that's the 17 million citywide, four and a half million neighborhoods of opportunity. If this 3 million would be coordinated with that or if it's a separate effort, uh, just how those two are gonna be related. And we also asked if the mayor's blue ribbon commission is involved at all in how these funds would be used. I have one more. Yes. Are there, is there any plan for affordable housing in that $3 million for CBD? The project description mentions affordable housing, but it's not clear if it's only for affordable housing. And I don't know if Danny wants to add. Yeah, I, sorry. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability, and then we can follow up with more information if we're not able to answer them now. It's my understanding that the affordable housing is not a requirement for this money, but it is possible that it can be used for that. The idea for this set of funds was to do housing within CBD, whereas the 21 million that was set aside specifically for affordable housing carries that requirement that it has to include it. So it's possible, but it's not a requirement. And we could make the money contingently appropriated upon a requirement of some aspect of affordability. I'd like us to be able to talk about that in future meeting then. Okay. 
uh, Madam Chair, and I, I, I would tend to agree. I think we should have a, a, at least a discussion about whether or not we want to use limited resources from the city to support market rate housing, um, since that the market seems to be doing a pretty good job of that. I can see, however, some situations where we might want to encourage uh, some sort of uh, market rate project with a commercial project where we aren't seeing some of those happening. So I don't know that I want to be exclusive, but I think we should have a conversation about whether or not we want to prioritize. Um, and maybe I'm thinking there are a lot of ways we could go, but one of them could be a point system where we give um, more credit to affordability in an application process or something like that. But I do think we need to have that policy conversation. Go ahead, Derek. Um, you know, I think we all agree that we need more affordable housing in the city. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, a supply and demand issue. So the more product we bring on, that'll have an impact on affordability. Um, and so I would be interested in entertaining an affordable housing requirement, but I would also be interested in having a conversation about um, three and four bedroom unit development. And maybe we don't, maybe we allow it to be market rate if we are getting other types of housing in our CBD that we currently aren't seeing the market take care of. Um, Cause I wanna see families downtown. And so this might be a good way for us to get uh, family housing. So just some thoughts. Thank you. Any other thoughts about this? The, um, I, I'm curious to know, historically, have we used CIP money for housing? I usually think of CIP as parks and streets, and, and so was this a great creative plan for us, and, and legally can we do this? So this gets to one of the differences between RDA capital projects and the general fund capital projects. To my knowledge, the general fund CIP has not paid for housing, but the RDA has a long history and is actually required to put some of its money aside for housing. So that's a good distinction to, to highlight. Okay, thank you for doing and that. For us. Madam Chair, so Ben, just um, for, for clarification, my understanding is that we have pretty consistently set aside a portion of RDA housing money to the uh, revolving loan fund uh, for uh, that tends to be affordable housing at the city, but we've also retained some RDA funding in districts for housing in, in particular districts. Is that accurate? So there's the two housing funds one is citywide and one is for project areas right. specific and i'd have to check in with the rda staff to answer your question for sure and, and so what, I, what i'm getting at, i think we're all i think we're all talking pretty much the same thing but i i want to see some maintenance of um, that I personally would like to see us continue to support the revolving loan fund that is citywide because it's really the only mechanism I'm aware of that takes RDA funding and supports it on a citywide uh, outside of RDA districts. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons, but one, if we hit our council priority, if we're putting on our council hats of dispersing affordability citywide, that's one of the few tools we have for looking at that. Um, as we talk about project specific um, area housing, um, like uh, Councilmember Kitchen mentioned, if we're trying to prioritize a type of housing or a demographic or a combination of commercial and housing, um, I think there is some opportunity for discussion there as well. And maybe we should do that at a project by project basis, because I'm not sure that that's necessarily something we want to do in every project area, but it's certainly an option we want to have. But what I would like to see is um, tools, uh, opportunities to select from that we talk about before we get into the specifics of a, of a certain project. If we're going to, uh, in some situations, allow for market rate, if it encourages a type of housing that we don't have that we think we need to have, then I think we need to be really clear about how we evaluate that and how we prioritize that. I'm a little worried um, about drawing a lot of city resources, regardless of whether that's general fund or RDA funds, into market rate. And from, from the evidence that I'm seeing now, market rate's taking care of itself, 
uh, itself, for, except for maybe a couple um, moderate exceptions. But I just want to be careful that we don't go too far down a road where we're saying we're using um, public resources to support what the market could or should take care of. Thank you. Any other comments on this? I am thinking in the interest of time, I'm going to ask board members to look down this list of questions and, and each of these areas. And if you have a specific question for one of the areas, um, will you raise that? And we won't, instead of going through every single question, since we're, I, I, I'm trusting you've read them and you've thought about it. And I know um, one of the things that uh, as the council we've been interested in and that I'd bring up again is the quiet zone. And do you want to say anything about that, Andrew, or the question sufficient in here? Um, the issues where it's raised? Okay. No, we, we still have some work to do to, I think, cobble together the stuff, so it's going to be an ongoing discussion over time. Okay, great. Are there, are there other questions? Yes, Aaron. I wondered in that vein how the bond potential fits into our considerations for these capital investments, particularly with infrastructure in the station center was a piece of that. One of the things staff put together earlier this year was a list of RDA projects that might be eligible for an RDA infrastructure bond. Uh, we can bring that back and include it in the staff report for the next briefings you have in front of you. And then we can look at these new proposed projects and see if we should add them to the list. Great, and I, could I request that at that next meeting, is it October 10th, that we have an update on the bond conversation? I know that there was one conversation that maybe didn't present what we assumed was going to be. So I'd like an update on that at that time too. And, and I'm wondering if, um, Danny, I don't know if you have this answer since a financial or who would have the answer, but when we can expect to see the um, bond information, do we know? Um, I was just informed by Mary Beth that she was oh, waiting, waiting on my response, which we thought we had sent down. So that information is ready to distribute. Great. So let me discuss a little bit about what we did, which was different than what we and had Mary previously. And Mary Beth, state your whole name. So oh, everybody. Mary Beth Thompson Thank in the you. finance department. Um, previously, we, did, we had cash flows that went to the financial advisors. Um, we went back and assessed, reassessed all those cash flow statements, um, increased some revenues, also probably increased a few expenditures. Those cash flows by project areas will be going to the financial advisors, as well as the cash balances that we have as of June 30th. So it's a little bit different way than we have done, than we did in the past, but it's saying this is how much cash we have, because that's what you have to go on, is how much cash you have available in each one of those project areas. Um, so I'm gonna give them all of those project areas that you have requested with cash balances and cash flows and then they will come back and say, this is how much you can bond for in each one of these project areas, and you can pick and choose what you want to do. Very good. Stan? If there are no other questions, um, I'd like to jump to the uh, next uh, policy questions around catalytic projects, and Mary Beth, this includes you. Um, so don't go away. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So we had talked about the idea of exploring um, a potential payback mechanism uh, where we might invest um, in an RDA area f with catalytic projects, and it might come out of the general fund, but we could do a payback mechanism over time as we collected tax increment to reimburse the the general fund. I know you haven't had a lot to do lately, so I'm just wondering if you've had an opportunity to either explore that a little more or to think about it a little more. Uh, and, and the question I guess I'm asking is I want to make sure that the impression we ha were left with, I was left with last time, was that's a distinct possibility. Um, is that still the assumption we're functioning under? Because that policy uh, question has a lot to do with that, I think. Yeah, I think that you could do that, or we've discussed, you know, general fund, um, using general fund bonding, and then RDA paying back the general fund portion. I'm going to also um, ask for that from the financial advisors, too, so I will come back with what the RDA's capabilities of bonding is and what the general fund's capabilities of bonding is, and then we can talk about if you had catalyst projects that you wanted the general fund to fund and then tax increment to reimburse the general fund. And Madam Chair, if it's acceptable, if, I, if you don't mind, Mary Beth, using the CDA on North Temple as an example, but if, if we ever got to a, a, 
situation where the tax increment collected there was higher than the bond payment, I would be really interested in looking at reimbursing the uh, general fund because the general fund has been picking up most of that bond payment and as that tax increment has been coming online. And so that uh, so, so if we're looking at that policy question, two things for me around catalytic projects, um, some ability to use maybe some of our program income revenue to start uh, to prioritize a catalytic project in a new area, and because that's, I think, provides some flexibility across RDA districts, and the other one would be to potentially use some uh, general fund bonding authority uh, to start a catalytic project that we patterned a, a payback plan um, that uh, tapped the increment over time. It, they're both a little, the, well, the, the general fund one is a little riskier, and, and I'm aware of that because um, what we're saying is we're putting the city general fund on the hook for it, and if the tax increment doesn't come back, then General funds on the hook for it, but I think it's worth looking at as an option. Very good, thank you. Anything more? I just Go wanted ahead. to add. I'm the sorry, North I Tem jumped ahead on you. Sorry, I apologize. I just wanted to add a little context for the North Temple Viaduct during the annual budget. We looked at that possibility, and in fiscal year 17, the project area was able to pay 35 percent of the cost and this fiscal year that increased to 47 percent so it's not close to 100 but it's moving in the right direction but there are some really significant projects that are coming online that won't be on the tax rolls for another year so it, that could change quickly in that particular CDA great thank you Ben you want anything more you want to that's everything I have, unless board members have more questions. There are other questions, and I apologize. I forgot to give a warm welcome to Danny Walls because I've <laughs> met with you several times. I forget this I'm is your here. first formal this meeting first as one. the COO of the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake, and we're happy to have you here, and thank you so much. Do you have anything you want to say? Uh, we, we do not at this time. We will be working with council staff as this comes back to you, and, and we obviously have some information we'd like to share and some some hopeful comments on the policy direction as well. Great, and you get to be with us for a number of the conversations this afternoon, so thanks so much. Thank you very much. Next up, item B3, tax increment reimbursement policy, and we adopted a policy in June. It was on the day uh, that we also passed the budget, and we discovered some things that maybe we hadn't paid close attention to, so um, we thought it might be smart to go back and take a look at it and make sure that policy is what we really want it to be. So with that, um, we've got um, Danny Walls with us and Tammy Hunsaker. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And Lar, do you want to join them or not? You are welcome to stay where you are or you're welcome to come up. Whichever you'd like. Laura's really happy sitting behind me okay. right now. Okay. <laughs> she, she, she got to sit in the seat yeah, for yeah, a long she, time. She, so she's she indicated comfy. she was okay unless okay, needed. Okay, great. We'll, we'll Thank pull you her so up, much. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you indicated, this was a, a policy that was adopted in June. And then as staff came forward with a potential project, there were some questions raised as to the details of how this project or program would be carried out. Following those questions, we held couple small group meetings with, with individual directors wherein we had some concerns expressed and questions raised to staff. You have our responses as staff to those concerns within your memo. We are also in receipt of um, some further discussion that has been circulated to the board earlier today. And so we are prepared to address any questions or concerns that the board has. And uh, Madam Chair, I would defer to you in terms of how you'd like the conversation to go, but we are ready, willing, and able to provide as much information or answer any questions you have. Very good, thank you. Board members. Yes. Yes, Board Member Mendenhall. Hey, thanks to staff for walking <laughs> probably most of us through this um, after we approved it. I really appreciate <laughs> it. it. It was great. I wish You're I had welcome. understood it that well before. I had one question based on the uh, meeting that we had and the understanding I left with and then what I'm reading here, and that's on, um, I think I'm in the staff report, yeah. On the second page under financial analyst third party verification, it says if warranted, RDA staff will use that. And I, 
I thought I understood that we absolutely would use a third party to verify their financials in the application. We anticipate probably having to use that third party verification most of the time. We just didn't want to make it a requirement that locked us into having to engage those services every time if the project didn't warrant it. And, and so the reason that I was really comfortable with the absolute of it um, is that we talked about would there be an opportunity for us to deny an application and how difficult even maybe um, litigious the conversation could become if we said no based on our own analysis versus saying no based on a third party analysis and that third party being one that analyzes all of these applications from this right. objective and, position. And I think that's a, a, a good point and that also ties into one of the comments we heard of when that third party verification or analysis would take place. and When in we, the flow chart. Where in the flow chart and so that's also why as part of the conversations we had the board members, we still kept that analysis happening after that initial presentation to the board because at that point what you have is you would have any initial discussions we would have with individual board meetings as well as that initial presentation at a board meeting prior to engaging those services. And so to us that ties into your request to be able to deny an application early on in the process rather than going down a path too far, engaging staff time and or spending the resources to do that analysis too prematurely. So we felt it was more important to be able to bring something to you at an initial stage and have the discussion of whether you were even interested in proceeding instead of doing all this work and then feeling like we've locked you guys into a decision that maybe you're not comfortable saying no to at that time. So the reasons we would say no in, those, in that early phase, in that sort of tier one level, are different from probably financial third party analysis reasons that would come up in later Absolutely. opportunities to potentially deny applications. They'd be more based on what the project is, what the scope of the work, what the benefit is of that project in terms of jobs, retention, growth, what the business is, all of those right. things. So. I, I appreciate that, um, but I really felt most comfortable knowing that each and every application, they, I mean, they're significant. They, they have to be 12 million and more, right, yeah. uh, of investment in order to even get before us. So and four or fewer a year, um, and we certainly I would like don't have to a problem. guarantee that we're having yeah. a third party verify. Okay. So and we don't have a problem doing that. I think one of the other reasons we didn't make it a requirement is because we also felt that these would be going to our own finance committee. And so you would have that same oversight that you currently have right now for any loans that the RDA does. And so we would lean on that finance committee and then to the extent that we felt either the gap analysis needed more research and or we wanted to check their financials and verify parts of their proposal. We still had that option to do the third party, but. I guess I, I feel like there's different, I'm saying there's a different reason for doing it though. And, and it's not because I, what I'm hearing is that it's a capability and I'm not saying that our financial team isn't capable of analyzing. Right. I'm, I'm saying that it, I heard that there may be litigious reasons for us to have a third party generate that information. Yeah, and that's why, that's why I said I think we would probably anticipate still using it for most of the projects. We didn't make it a requirement, but I think in terms of the confidentiality and the potential risk for us seeing some of those uh, financials, we would probably lean on that third party most of the time. Is there a reason that we wouldn't change this to say always? No, nope, we could say always. Like I said, I think we were just not comfortable committing that for each one, knowing that some of them may not warrant it or that we didn't want to spend those resources. But I don't think as staff we would have any problem making that a requirement. I think you're, I completely agree with you that the f placement in the flow chart is that it's a, it's after we've had the opportunity to learn about mm -hmm. the benefits of the project and whether or not we want to push it to that second sure. tier. Um, and at that point, it doesn't feel like each and every application would necessarily go to that next level right. of, of evaluation. But I would like us to um, assure that everyone that gets advanced to that phase in the process does go through a third party verification. I think we could do that and then make that part of the information that the Finance Committee would review and, and vote on. Thank you. So. Aaron, can I have you phrase that in a straw poll? <laughs> sure, um, but I'm looking at the staff report, so I'm not sure if the language in here is a, actually the language. Um, well, it's a straw poll, so we can. Okay, we so we want to get the idea that third-party verification will be used in 
uh, analyzing applications for the tax increment benefit. Uh, in analyzing the tax increment benefit applications. Is that the name of this? Am I calling this the right thing? Tax, tax increment reimbursement program applications will go through a third party analysis at the appropriate time in the process. But in, in, all cases, in all cases. Yes, thank okay. you. Any discussion about it? Yeah. Yeah. Is there an opportunity perhaps to make it an opt out instead of an opt in in this case? Because this way it gives leeway to say we can if we choose. Could we say by rule you will unless the board approves something otherwise? If there's a the reason for it that I understood, and Danny correct me if I'm wrong, is that if we didn't do it to each and every one and we used maybe sometimes our internal financial analysis and sometimes an additional third party, if we said no to one of those, um, they might argue that we didn't thoroughly analyze their application and that this could become litigious, or that um, they, you know, that there was some sort of unfair representation, but that because it happened, perhaps their application was only in-house and the third party didn't happen. But by having an objective third party analysis of their financial declarations, then we can um, more freely have the opportunity to say yes or no at these different phases where we can say yes or no without being blamed for. Do we have a clear answer on that legal question then? I, I don't want to speak for Katie. She can come up and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the way the program and or any agreements are structured is that you have the right to say no at any time for any reason. That they have the right to sue us for saying no. They do. I mean, and that would be just like any other time you have a public offering for property and someone doesn't like the result. I mean, you would, you would structure your denial or approval based on whatever you felt were the objectives that the project accomplished, but that you don't necessarily have to defend or support that beyond that. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Aaron, is there anything preventing from somebody suing us no matter what, even if this third party were to be put hey, in place? I'm just, this is the way it was presented to me and the reason for the third party analysis. I'm and then when the I read this, <laughs> come on now. So I'm just trying to get I think clarity for us, the, based the bigger on what reason I learned for the from third you guys. Party <laughs> the bigger reason for the third party analysis for us as staff was simply that we don't necessarily want to hold their confidential financial documents. Right. And so that gives us the ability to not. And I think that kind of tied into the litigation issue, not only for that reason, but then it became if, if we denied it. But I think to your point, yes, we could be sued for any reason or we could say yes or no for any reason. And I'm not sure that having a third party analysis provides us any extra defense or credibility in terms of that lawsuit. Katie Lewis. <laughs> Hi, Katie Lewis from the city attorney's office. Um, the board always has the right to approve or not approve a tax increment reimbursement deal. The board also can certainly have third party experts as a requirement for the basis by which they make those decisions to approve or not. And if that makes you feel more comfortable, I. I can't say whether that increases or decreases the chance of litigation, but obviously having a process that's the same for every single application has some merit in terms of defensibility. And also not having those financial records in our offices, um, especially if we choose not to go down the path that those businesses can feel assured that their information is safe which somehow I'm not sure why it'd be more safe in another office than in <laughs> ours. But wouldn't be subject to grandma. Wouldn't be subject to grandma. Well, that's a dang good reason to use <laughs> third party people. Are there, what, are the, what are the times when we wouldn't want to look at a third party situation that you alluded to? I think depending on the scope of the project and or, I mean, you could have anything from what the investment is, what, you know, is, is the investment strictly um, capital investment of, of the owners versus financing. I mean, if you, if it was just straight up cash, would you care what their financials were if they were paying for it? Um, if you didn't necessarily have to tie it to any performance measures in terms of jobs or, you know, what their, their performance or what their, the details of their business are, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily need it, so. But the trade-off is we save money essentially by keeping it in-house. Is that the 
Yeah, and, and, and obviously the money's an issue, but even, even to that extent, you could always scale back the scope of what that financial verification would be. So what's the benefit of not going to third party then? What is the benefit? Just cost and timing and- Cost and time. You know, abuse of the applicant. Cindy Guest Jensen. Just um, kind of to take the council back a step, because this is one of those situations where you, where you had individual meetings, and so things evolved throughout that, and that, that's the downside of having the individual meetings. But in the meeting where uh, Council Member Mendenhall was, the conversation was, um, this, is a, this is a new approach, and obviously there are some council members who are not comfortable with it, uh, what would it take to make uh, your comfort levels increase? And so this was something that was discussed as a, as, as a standard throughout so that you don't get into situations where there's a rush decision, there's a confidential decision, all those sorts of things, that it's done in an orderly way with the same criteria applied in every case. So that's just the background for in that particular meeting, and that was um, one of the standards. I th there were two or three um, things that were, that the administration said, yeah, that, that works. So if, if we're skipping steps in some of the cases or if we're handling them in different ways, um, it's a little less predictable for the board and you could, the idea was to not get boxed in, I think was the. Madam Chair, any idea what this is gonna cost on the, on the budget to do this? For the reviews? Mm -hmm. If you were to look at it from last year to. We've done some of those for loans before, do you have an idea of cost? I mean, I would, I would put it at the five to $10,000 range. I mean, I'd be surprised if it was more than that. Yeah, we could go back and look at that. We have Amy Rowland with the National Development Council on retainer for a certain block of hours each month. So we could go look at a loan or a previous tax increment reimbursement deal and kind of see how many hours she allocated to one deal. We also have saved as much as $700,000 annually by taking um, the legal work in-house instead of having it go out. So I'm comfortable with yeah. that amount. I'll call for the question. Okay, so um, those, I, I'm gonna summarize it, um, probably not as well as you stated it, but those who would like to have when, uh, an outside opinion on tax inc increment reimbursement, um, always thumbs up. Those opposed to that, thumbs down. And it is unanimous, thank you. <laughs> but that was a good discussion. I'd also like to welcome board member Charlie Luke. Uh, welcome, we're glad you're here. And um, I want to draw your attention to your blue folders where you have um, a handout with a list of things that I'm interested in doing as potential straw polls with reference to this. Um, and this, we, you just received this today, as did the administration, so I, I if you've got questions about it, we can do that. And I'm going to ask Jennifer Bruno if you'll come up. Um, she helped us come up with this. We we discussed it yesterday and just thought it would be good to um, have some conversation about it. So I'm going to make sure I've got the right memo in front of me. <laughs> so just one second. Um, all right. Um, additional questions before we work our way through this? Madam Chair. Yes. I do have a question, Danny, um, in regards to um, the, the desire or the need in some of these situations for the property owner to want to maintain confidentiality as the details are being worked out on a proposal and the sort of balance I feel that it's required uh, for us as, a, as an acting body, a public body, and tax dollars about how, how to walk that line around disclosure. And I, I wonder if you address that in this process of, of looking at your procedures, uh, your flow chart, or um, was there a conversation uh, at a staff level about public disclosure of the plan before we're talking about it in a public setting. Right, and, and the reason for that is because this is designed to be a competitive incentive tool to encourage economic development. And so a lot of these deals that come before us 
these businesses are potentially talking to either other municipalities or looking at other ways of doing the project. And so at least early on as part of that initial conversation that we would have both at the staff level with the applicants as well as starting to have those conversations with the board, there's, there's a great concern from the standpoint of the developer or the property owner of having those discussions remain somewhat confidential at that time because as they are looking at structuring the deal, you certainly don't want to put out the information and have those negotiations happen in a public forum. And so what we have done is at least set up in the flowchart the possibility that we can come and speak to you as a board and present you the initial conditions for what the project would be and the details and see number one, if you are interested at that time at proceeding and having staff continue that conversation or if the answer is no, and if you are interested in proceeding, what would be some of those concerns and issues that you would potentially want staff to address and flush out in those negotiations with the property owner before we get to a point where they have somewhat committed to us and wanting to do the project in Salt Lake City. And then at that point, it would come back before the board, and obviously the project details would be made more public at that time. Having said that, the property owners and the businesses are always somewhat sensitive to having either proprietary information about their business and or their financials and or the wages that are tied to some of the jobs, which could potentially be a major negotiation point for us. They do not want that necessarily becoming public information. And so that is the advantage of having that third party verification always be separate, whereas you as a board would get that information in terms of a summary and or whether it addresses your goals and your objectives of what you want the project to be but it wouldn't necessarily be shared in detail over what the exact numbers are. So one of the concerns that I have personally is the, the um, perception that some people in the public have about the idea of secret deals around economic development packages. And the most obvious is a Facebook project right. where you know the, the deal was happening, but nobody was willing to disclose the details of the deal, and, um, and it was a pretty significant public investment in dollars. Um, and, and I think there's a valid um, criticism to be uh, laid upon us uh, when we're, we're, our goal is to be transparent with how we deal with tax dollars. So do you feel like this balance gets us there? Do you feel comfortable with that balance? I mean, I, I, I'm always gonna be uh, probably the one who errs a little bit on the side of being as transparent as possible with any kind of sure. uh, public financing? I think the balance gets us there because again, the benefit is for the property owner or the developer. It's not so much that we're withholding information as much as we are not necessarily sharing their information until such a time that it comes before the board and needs an approval. So it's not that we're keeping anything secret as much as we're just controlling the release of that information such that it doesn't affect the negotiation and or whether the project moves forward. And so one of the concerns from my perspective is how far down the road do we get without knowing the specifics? and. Um, uh, being asked to indicate whether we're supportive or not, but it looks like in your floor, flow chart that could be pretty early on based on some sort of ba find, fundamental criteria that yeah. we're looking for. That would be the first public meeting. You would have the initial release of information, and obviously between that time and when you give final approval, details may change, but you would have at that point what the goals are that are being met, how they're being met, early indications of what the costs and the details of the project are. And so. It really just gives us that initial step of being able to discuss with you as board members of whether you even want us to proceed with it without letting the property owner have to disclose that information publicly. Thank you. Um, and just uh, for my fellow council members, I, 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 I wanna share with you one of the concerns I continually have about um, the challenges we have with recruiting business um, to our community and the ability to support those businesses and uh, employees long term um, because generally um, high paying jobs don't return revenue to the city property tax returns revenue to the city so i think that's a, a nuance that we have to be really aware of as we go down these roads because it's very tempting i think to say oh, wow we're going to get 120 high paying salary jobs uh, fewer than 10% of those will live in Salt Lake City. And so um, looking at how we provide public services uh, with our council hats on to that company when they're bringing employment, and I'm not trying to 
diminish uh, the importance of high paying salaries either. Um, but it's certainly a balance and it's not the only factor that should be a consideration when we're looking at businesses locating in our city. Thank you. Thank you. I am um, looking at the clock. I'm making a decision that we are going to take item number four before land disposition policy um, proceeds policy off this agenda and bump it to October because I have I would really like to take um, straw polls on everything that is in uh, your folders so if we can do that and I've asked Jennifer um, to join us uh, if you've got questions about any of the questions uh, that we've raised about policy and let's start off with the with the first one um, the where the question is whether or not the policy should could if we should amend it um, in this section in 5.1 to add clarity and confirm that the board has the final approval authority when using this particular tool and can say no for any reason so um, and, and Madam Chair, yeah, if ahead. I could just make a, yeah. a note of clarification, obviously this yeah. was written very quickly, right. so it probably doesn't have all the context that it needs to. It's not that the policy doesn't allow for the board to be the final authority, um, but I think in many of these deals, just um, to your point of um, setting clear expectations both for the developer and for the city from the get-go, um, I think there could be added clarity that would make it clear that, you know, the board reserves the right to, you know, and we haven't worked on wording yet, but if the council or if the board was interested, we could work with the attorney's office on the appropriate wording, but to make it uh, extremely clear in the beginning from the get-go that this is not a given, that, you know, this is a, a potential tool that ultimately the board has the authority to say yes or no to. And just to add some clarity with um, Utah Title 17C, it's very clear that any tax increment reimbursement deal needs to be approved by the board by resolution. So whereas the loan program, you've delegated authority for the finance committee to approve loans at 500,000 or lower, you can't right. do that with, with tax increment reimbursement. Thanks but for we that can add, we can definitely add language to make that more Thanks. clear. So is there discussion on this? I'm, I'm hoping we can go through this with somewhat <laughs> expeditiously but I no, I don't want to cut off good conversation and getting questions answered so with that um, I will take the first straw poll uh, on the sheet of this does the board wish to amend the existing policy and all supporting materials to make it clear that the final approval authority for any tax increment reimbursement proposal including single property community reinvestment areas CRAs rests with the board and that and in line with state law any discussion about that? This okay. is just stating what's already there, basically, then? And just confirming that locally we're um, on, in line with what the state says. We've had a problem in the past of not always being aligned with state I, law. I, I think the yeah. other thing, just to add, is um, the, the final authority of the board uh, to approve this is implied. And a lot of times when developers are sort of rushing to sort of make their deal work, um, I think they don't always, you know, they, they assume the best <laughs> case scenario, which is that you wouldn't put together a tool unless the board was going to approve it if you met all the criteria. But ultimately, if the board, if a business meets all the criteria, it's still up to the board to say yes or no to the business, even if they meet all of the criteria. And so um, we found in, in other city incentive packages, it, it makes sense to make extra clear upfront for zoning, for example, that just because you can put together an application for a rezoning doesn't obligate the city council to say yes to a rezoning. Um, and so it reduces frustration on the back end to make it abundantly clear on the front end that, that that's... I don't know if Cindy. Yeah. Cindy, just another quick addition is, and not necessarily relating to RDA, but in other areas, uh, we get a situation where you have people calling the council office saying, "This is all done. All we need is council sign off," and so they are viewing the council as um, a rubber stamp. And what you've taught us is that you're not a rubber stamp. So. A lot of these things that Jennifer has raised is is to uh, get that into writing. Does that give us some clarity? So those in favor of uh, the straw poll, as I stated it, thumbs up. Any opposed? Okay, it is six in favor and one not present. Uh, next item, capital expenditure requirement. Um, 
There's a desire by some board members that the developer's security of other government incentive loans not count toward the $12 million capital investment, expressing the desire that it be truly new investment expansion in the market. For example, would it qualify if these sources were from other government loans and incentives? And the straw poll on that would be, do we wish to clarify the terms of this requirement for a single property CRA deal and discuss how the local business meets the minimum $12 million in capital expenditures. So we want to delve into how they're meeting that minimum. Is that something we, we want in policy? Sarah? Can we Questions? request yeah. uh, either Danny or Laura to speak to this and in, if there are pros or cons that they can imagine immediately on from, this proposal? From staff perspective, we don't have any problem with stating that the $12 million has to be owner investment capital, New investment. that there can be other funding sources involved in the project, but those are on top of that $12 million. So that's how we've clarified it and we're comfortable with making that requirement. Great. Okay, right, those in favor, thumbs up. Any opposed? Stan and Aaron? Okay, okay, thanks, you weren't here. Okay, thank you. Uh, six in favor, one abstention. Turning to the next one. Um, annual application limit and I know um, Jennifer do you want to give a little background on this yeah um, so the RDA staff memo uh, goes into this a little bit that they're proposing to limit um, the number of applications that they would process per year to four um, staff workload is a, a huge driver of that obviously um, one other concern or, or option that was raised in one of the small group meetings was to consider it from a monetary value um, perspective um, that probably doesn't take into account the staff workload uh, as well, because you could probably have a lot of applications for low dollar amounts that would um, probably overtax staff. Um, but that was just one other thing that we raised just to make sure that the council members uh, who had met in small group meetings uh, concerns were uh, heard. So, But the RDA staff is proposing four per year to start. So the um, straw poll is just whether or not we want to explore the options to limit or constrain the use of the tool. And so it's not. And, and maybe uh, you could uh, straw poll whether or not you uh, support the RDA staff's recommendation of four per year or if you wanted to view it a different way. Okay, so let's do that first. Barry, yes. Could I, before we straw poll this, I, I, maybe there were others, but this was a concern that came up in my meeting that I wanted us to be really frank about the reality of the shift in that money that those funds from if uh, we don't have the same kind of flow chart as we did in the small group meeting that had some hypothetical right. dollar amounts attached to it but you know it's fifty thousand dollars hypothetically or more a year that would come out of the general fund that we would be giving back through this reimbursement program and that's a significant amount. Like it, it, when you add it up, it, it gets to the kind of money that we get really desperate for when it comes to um, the budget. So it, the, I just want us to be really cognizant that we are shifting money out of the general fund into these possible um, scenarios. And Danny, did you want to address two that? Two points to that, if I could. Number one, I think I think the point is is well made in terms of uh, one of the other items on this list is what the potential percentage would be from the city contribution. And so I think that has to factor into this conversation as well because obviously that drives the dollar amount. But I think in terms of when you look at tax increment, we need to keep in mind that we're not talking about existing dollars. We're talking about potential future dollars. And so we need to be aware that each of these projects, when we go into them, we freeze the property taxes where they're at right now, and that's the base year. So the city continues to get everything that they're getting right now off of the property in terms of supporting the general fund and the services. And what we're talking about here is the potential for new property tax revenue. And even that, going back to my first point, a percentage of that. And so you're looking at the potential of generating property tax revenue that doesn't exist today, as well as the city potentially getting a piece of that additional increment so that they can have that benefit the general fund. And then obviously after the 15 or 20 year life of the project, the city gets 100% of it. And so I just wanna make it clear that we're not taking existing funds from the general fund as much as we are deferring the potential for an increase to the general fund. Madam Chair, 
Yes. Danny, is it a fair assessment to say, however, that in some of these situations, just by the mere factor of increasing the size of a business or the number of employees, we could actually increase the cost of providing services to that location? So do you factor that in as you're looking at this percentage piece at all? Uh, we don't necessarily do a direct comparison or factor, but I think that's something that you take into account in terms of what the city's benefit or percentage should be of the project so i appreciate that you know you're talking about future tax dollars but the reality c could be that we could be required to provide additional public services right. to these facilities almost immediately upon them yep. opening or completing you, you are you're you're always getting that that as a building gets bigger or more employees or more impact on the roads that's an impact but you're also getting the potential of higher sales tax or right. you know that they're doing public improvements or that their new building will potentially have less of an impact because they've upgraded services or fire response or sure. alarm. So, sure. and, and again, those are, those are very hard to directly compare, but I think that does have to become part of the conversation over what part of the city would get. And you could look at that on a case-by-case -case basis that obviously depending on the proposed use, it could represent a higher impact on police, whereas something else may have a minimal impact. So. Yes. Thanks. Well, and, and if I may, Madam Chair, one of the challenges that the uh, county faced, uh, in particular over big box developments, and I know this is a little bit different, but in many ways those were um, sort of property specific, um, CRAs or CDAs. Um, what they faced was that as soon as the um, tax increment expired, the company would move, box up, move, you know, close down the Walmart, move down the street to the next um, deal. Um, what ability does the city have to um, prevent that from happening in these situations? Are we just perpetuating a, you know, a 15 year renegotiation of a tax increment pro <laughs> program? You, you, you could, but I think the benefit that you have is, is number one, a lot of those deals, the reason they hurt the city is because they took the sales tax whereas we're dealing with the property tax. And so to the extent that the building remains, depending on who that tenant is, you will still get the benefit of the property tax, number one. Number two, um, I think what you have is the potential that as those properties move on, yeah, you could have a, a redevelopment that needs to occur within the project itself, but to the extent that you're addressing goals that you want to accomplish within that 15 or 20 years, that's where you should be looking to get your benefit. You should not be looking at year 21 for the city to get the benefit as much as if we're going to give up our property tax revenue, what are we getting for those 15 or 20 years in the meantime? And have we considered, Madam Chair, can I jump in here? Yes, please. A tiered uh, structure on our reimbursement percentage so that the first five years is 100% and we ratchet down every five years we haven't looked at the tier. All we've done at this point is leave open the possibility that it may be less than 100%. Um, There's a question that's related to that um, a couple of mm -hmm. ways down, and it came up in one of the small group meetings as something that staff was willing to consider um, in terms of is the assumption that Salt Lake City's participation is 100% and then it kind of goes, is negotiated down from there, or do you set the expectation that Salt Lake City's participation is some other percent? 50 or whatever and then you negotiate up based on tiers or you know whatever um, public policy goals are achieved with the project that's a, absolutely where I was going with that and I you know I don't know if the staff has had the time to do much you know research on developing what that could look like but if the board was interested then we could keep working with RDA staff on that aspect of it so we do other similar incentive based programming right. with other departments throughout mm -hmm. the city. And it seems like this would be a good one to not start with 100% and disappoint by ever having to go down, but be really clear about, um, they, they know what advantages we are looking for in projects in terms of a citywide benefit, and that satisfaction of XYZ could lead to higher reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love for staff to explore that if the board's interested. Dan? Yeah, and, and Danny, one of the things I really like about our um, loan model is that when you meet, uh, the RDA did a, uh, staff did an incredible job of looking at when you hit certain benchmarks, you get a percentage break in that. And I'm wondering if we could structure this in a similar way uh, for predictability so that you know that if you are able to provide this uh, goal that we're trying to accomplish, you get some sort of increased percentage or you get some, you get something you can be sure of. Uh, I think that way it takes some of this um, one, you know, sort of negotiating each project one by one out of the 
mix and says, here's our agreed upon goals. We want you to strive towards these goals and we'll incentivize that. So if that's a, something that's a possibility, I think that I really love the way the loan program ended up being structured because it's very clear that you get a point break every time you hit one of those green energy goals or whatever it happens to be. So. <laughs> So, board members, I, I want to straw poll this proposal that we look at a sliding scale of our participation and ask the RDA staff to come back to us with a proposal of what that would look like. Uh, those in favor of that? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank and if I might make some suggestions, there are some really clear city policies that I think are good starting points. There's um, probably an employment comp component and a percent of right. uh, higher salaries. But I think green energy is a really good one. It's been a priority for the mayor and the administration. If we can look at projects that really sort of double down on our commitment to being green and efficient, that should be something we're really um, encouraging investment in great thank you um next one uh, we'll go go back to the one yeah, the that we were four on. per year yeah. <laughs> um, that's settled. Uh, uh, that we were going to talk about uh, uh, does the board desire the Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I know this is okay. taking longer than you anticipated. Danny, what's the staff's capacity to process these? I mean, I think that's a factor as well. Is it, are you comfortable with a number like at, what, where are we at, four, I think we said? For a year, is that something that you, if we really had for a year, does the staff have the capacity to process for? Yeah, that was an internal discussion we had, and, and we kind of looked at it and said, okay, if, if each of these took just, you know, two to three months each, that would basically be one per quarter. And we thought that was a good threshold to, to set initially. You know all four of these will come in January. I, I know. And, and right, that, you know that, gonna, right? The fact that they, we said that, we're going to It would be lovely right if they were spread out one per quarter, <laughs> but they will all come at the same time. They will all come at the same time. But I think, I mean, the, the good thing is if they all came at once and you could just do the same process four different times, so maybe that would be better, we'd get it done. Um, but that was, that was what we felt comfortable with is that initial threshold. And if we end up being wildly successful or that we we get some really good projects that are above that four then obviously we would come back to the board and see if you had any interest in doing okay. more or but we thought that was just that so this is a this is a number the the the, the staff look yes. and and that was a factor your capacity yep. to look okay great yes so uh, those those in favor of I'm going to change this a little bit of uh, supporting the staff proposed limit to four projects per year with the ability for the staff to come back to us if they need want to do additional projects um, and that that be reflected in our policy all in favor of that for a year <laughs> i appreciate you being concerned for my time <laughs> always come back to us but yeah. never That's, mind okay Th thank you okay jennifer uh, the next is clarification of metrics. Um, it came up in a few of the meetings that um, board members were interested in having sort of standard base metrics so that we could track um, whether it be um, either benefit or cost to the general fund or whether it be wages of the employees um, based on what the company says and then actually what they do. There are um, some pretty robust reporting um, requirements that the RDA staff is suggesting um, in terms of the company reporting to the RDA board, but just wasn't clear to us that there would be base metrics across all projects. It said that the metrics would be established sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, which that probably makes sense for some of the metrics that, you know, maybe employment doesn't apply to a project or two. Um, but maybe there are certain metrics that would apply regardless of what kind of project it was, and I don't know if the board wants more discussion on that. Any thoughts on that, board members? Danny, do you have any thoughts on the um, type of metrics? I think, I think within the program itself right now in section 5.2, you have the basic metrics right there. And then I think as we flush out the conversation regarding what additional percentage of increment or how that increment would be tailored to what the goals are that they're going to address, I think we would also be addressing this problem between What's the base and what percentage does that get you? And what are the additional metrics and how much more increment could you get that way? So I think that would be addressed with that other topic. Okay, further questions? I have a question yeah. um, that is sort of not, it's maybe a non sequitur with this particular issue, but in thinking about our 
average household income and the all the talk about the high wage jobs being an incentive for us but the reality of housing location not being in our favor i wonder if the administration's had conversations or has ideas around incentivizing employment housing in the city or creating some kind of a whether it's a metric i'm not sure if we're quite there yet but how do we better capture the benefits of the high wage jobs i mean sales tax really doesn't do it for us and unless they're going out to Ruth's Chris for lunch every day and spending a lot more on their lunch than most people are. I think to, to get into the area where you're incentivizing housing for higher wage jobs gets us back to our earlier conversation of should we be allocating government resources to market rate and above housing. And I think that would be where that conversation is. I don't and think so. it's quite about um, financial incentives. I, I wonder if there, and, and this is for another discussion, but isn't, is there some way, or is there some way that cities are asking companies to assist their employees in locating in the city that they're working in? And are there ways besides us incentivizing financially market rate housing, are there ways for us to assist in that to increase from 10%. I, I think it's something we can have that conversation and work with Laura and the Economic Development Department of what could we do in terms of our conversations with these companies of. I don't doubt that other cities are asking that question also and yeah. looking at ways to capture those employees in housing. Yeah, it's an important part of business recruitment. So Danny, if I, if I might just extend on that a little bit, Madam Chair, um, I can imagine incentivizing things like um, electric charging stations or a, a UTA pass program or some sort of shared ride program or sort of right. uh, sort of green things that that we think would reduce the impact to some of our public services. Um, uh, I mean, ideally, I would love to see how we could capture housing opportunities for those high pay, higher paid jobs. The reality is that's going to be really challenging. But there may be ways to um, capture um, some other city priority benefits in the process. And I, and I think those are very realistic, or they feel like they could be very realistic. We, we could look at that as one of the metrics for capturing additional reimbursement percentage, if you like. I, I don't know if we're there yet. I don't yet, know how we would get that, but right. we, we can look at see if someone else has figured this out and come back with I think there's a discussion them. between HAND and RDA probably, or within the Economic Development Department really, about how do we better capture mm -hmm. and incentivize in place, and are other cities finding creative ways to do that? It sounds to me like you. Um, have base metrics, but just so that we can be clear, I'm, I want to do a straw poll on uh, whether or not we want to have standard base metrics and invite the RDA staff to come back to us with what those specifics would be. All in favor of that? Looks like we're unanimous. Six in favor. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Jennifer. And then the next one is related. It's um, uh, defining key terms. This came up a couple of times in terms of uh, in the small group meetings about you know what is what does job retention mean? If you're trading a high paying job for a low paying job, is that really job retention? And so um, section 5.2 um, that uh, Danny referred to is where all of the requirements are listed, but um, some of the terms, I don't know if the board wants to have discussion about what it means. Um, I think most of them we've discussed and probably don't need to spend as much time on, but this concept of, uh, let's see, 5.2b says the local business must demonstrate the project will result in job retention and or job creation. So I don't know if it's the term job that the board wants to discuss or um, is it high paying jobs, you know, is it 100% AMI or greater, is it I don't know. Those are those are some of the ideas that were thrown out in the small group meetings, and um, I don't know if the board had thoughts about that. Is there a desire to be that specific, James? You know, we, we classify housing, right? I think that job creation should be classified as well, whether it's 60, 80, 100 percent of AMI. I think it makes a lot of sense to see what kind of jobs are coming to the city. That way we can track base and figure out what kind of housing, if they are looking, even looking in the city or not for housing. So for me, classifying it would be... 
And in the interest of, you know, pr presenting all sides, I think that one of the concerns that um, RDA staff raised in the small group meetings was that we don't want to be overly prescriptive if there's this really great opportunity that in a particular neighborhood makes sense. Um, we wouldn't want to necessarily lose that opportunity just for the sake of, um, of you know, we were two percentage points short of the AMI or something like that. But I don't know if maybe tracking the the kind of job payment, you know, for I, the year or two. I guess just to top it off, I mean, we hear about Post Serial and UPS coming into the Northwest Quadrant. They're going to bring 1,000 jobs or 2,000 jobs. What are those jobs, right? I think a greater detail for us is the council to know if the investment was worth it or not. So maybe starting with tracking the kinds of um, employment and then following up in a year with a policy discussion about what the council what looks board like. would like to see going forward. Okay, is there a desire to do that? Track, track it and then in a year look at it and have a policy discussion. All in favor? I'm feeling like Charlie back in 2014. I'm taking so many straw polls. You're right at home, huh? And, and, well, we just want to make sure we've got, got it clear. Okay, Jennifer. Um, the next is somewhat related, the um, idea that uh, companies report um, their performance based on the agreement. I think that because this is a uh, yearly payment, the RDA has an extreme amount of leeway in terms of you know, we don't have to pay them unless they, you know, prove that they have satisfied the terms of the agreement. But um, just trying to gauge the temperature of the board, how clear you wanted to be in terms of, you know, will you claw money back if they've demonstrated, for example, that they've taken their jobs elsewhere? I don't know, worst case scenario. Um, or uh, are there other provisions that if they don't meet the terms of the agreement, you know, there's some sort of penalty or or something like some some sort of incentive to keep them on track meeting their agreement and reporting it <laughs> madam chair yes one of those for me and maybe we need i need to look at the flow chart and you can tell me where this would happen but um if we approved it and they get into their investment and the capital work that needs to be done and things happen so that they aren't able to actually invest that 12 million mm -hmm. that um, things fall apart. Do we have it set up so that we absolutely would be aware of the actual investments at the time you know, annually when we would be cutting the checks yes. for reimbursement? Yes. So what you typically do is you would structure the reimbursement agreement so that you would have the initial conditions that they would have to meet. And that would be verifying the cost for the total project that they've made the investment and the building's done. And then you would also have your ongoing annual requirements that you would monitor and those would be things that you tie to are they maintaining potentially what their assessed value should be so that they can generate the increment do they have the jobs in place anything else that you've tied to your reimbursement of funds you would be tracking that annually as part of actually cutting them a check but that first requirement would be to make sure that the project investment was there and danny how long could they take to make that 12 million dollar investment Usually give them up to a year, maybe a year and a half, depending on the scope of the project and what, what is required to, to bring it to fruition. And would our reimbursement, I, I know that this could be contract dependent, but would the reimbursement begin once that um, investment is completed? It's a completely performance based, so they only get it if they generate it. And so it doesn't even kick in until it hits the tax rolls. And then it's a whole nother 15 months before we even get the dollars and so we don't give them a dime until we as the agency have actually received that property tax increment. thank you thanks for that clarification all right so um do does the board want to require uh in policy specific compliance standards beyond self-reporting uh, that must be met in order to receive annual tax increment reimbursements you are in favor of, yeah, go ahead. Jennifer. And maybe the question just needs to be, does the um, board support the RDA staff's proposal? Because it sounds like yeah. there's That's reporting. so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so are you in favor of the staff proposal? Thumbs up. Okay. Looks like we are in favor of that. Um, six in favor, one abstention. And I, I just would ask a question and... Um, do you, do you think we need to discuss the clawback or is that something you are looking at What anyway? we would typically do is we would, the clawback as I would propose it right now is you would tie that to whatever the percentage is that for those initial, um, for those additional metrics that you would want. 
And so let's say you started at 75% and then they earn 15% more if they accomplish three of these provisions. To the extent that they didn't hit those thresholds, you would just reduce that reimbursement by that amount. And so that's how we would propose it if you want more detail on that. But we could write that into the next draft if you wanted to, to show would you Would you do that? Mm -hmm. Board members, are you comfortable with my asking that without straw polling it? Just, I, I'll say yeah. that I will want to understand better how critical or elemental those different provisions are where some might be, the, the you know, requirements, yes. even to be to the 75% may not be, or it may be excessive based on the lack of fulfillment of certain provisions right. where others may not be as critical. So yeah. I'll just help me understand that when we get there. And this, this is, I'm really not wanting to go off another track, but just a question that I have, and I don't know that it even plays in here, but I know a frustration in Sugar House was that there was a developer who was given RDA loan money and um, did development with the agreement that there would be public available to public parking available. And as soon as the loan was paid off, that then um, that did not need to be provided for, and the loan was paid off quickly. So the public parking went from free or very little to $10 really fast. And that has been a huge source of frustration. And I think it was a loophole that no one realized was there. And I don't want to see us having that happen in the future. And I don't know if I'm, this is the right, it's dawning on me now, so it may not be the exact <laughs> right spot to bring this up. But I think we want, we want to be aware of that in the future, that when we're trying to benefit the community, that we aren't giving somebody a, you know, it's like, hmm, they needed the loan, but all of a sudden they can pay it off really quickly if it means that they can start collecting parking fees. And Madam Chair, if I may, I, mean, I think, Danny, one of the, the, maybe the challenges is identifying those public benefit issues that we re work out a deal with the property owner that aren't tied to whether or not they have a loan with us. So in order to qualify for a loan, they need to have some agreement to provide these services. And so I think that situation, at least, which actually surprised everybody, I think, but that situation Lisa's referencing was just no one ever thought to separate the benefit from the financing mechanism. And so once the loan was paid, there was no legal obligation, so. I do that, so sorry I <laughs> took us down that trail, but I have to say it when I think of it. Okay, Jennifer. So the next one, I, I apologize if you guys have already discussed it, I was having some network trouble over there. Um, the timing of the third party verification, I know you've discussed having a third party verification for every um, application. I wasn't quite clear if, so in the flow chart right now, the timing would be after the board adopts an initiating resolution, then, you know, then there's enough interest to go to the expense and trouble of hiring a third party verifier. I can see the flip side that you might not know if you're interested in adopting a um, initiating resolution unless you know for sure that there's a gap. So I can, you know, I can see both sides of, of um, uh, not wanting to spend the expense unless you're interested and not knowing if you're interested unless you know that there's really uh, a need there. So just didn't know if the board had already discussed the timing issue. Board members, do you feel like we covered that sufficiently or? Or if you're cool, or if you're okay with how uh, the RDA staff has proposed it in the flow chart. Are you comfortable with the proposal uh, in the flow chart? Which, by the way, thank you for that. That was really helpful, <laughs> both in the small group and to have that today. I appreciate that. Okay, I'm not seeing okay. concern about um, that. The next right. two we've covered. Yep. So then uh, the annual reporting requirement is more of like an internal reporting requirement. Um, this falls in line with a lot of the reporting requirements that the council has requested from other departments of just department activities. So just keeping track of uh, the disperse, disbursements that are made, not just the deals that are signed, but annually what disbursements are made so that, um, you know, that we can track funds. Uh, obviously, you'll see it in the budget, but um, sometimes it's nice to have it in sort of a report, sort of like your land reports. Do we, do we want to have that in policy, that we receive a regular report? Any discussion on that? Okay, those in favor? Thumbs up. And that is six in favor, and Derek Kitchen is absent for the vote. And that would be an annual or uh, annual? And, and I was assuming annual, or is, if I'm incorrect, 
Tell me. Okay. We'd like it every single month. No. <laughs> <laughs> we can do One that. One person occupied full time. It'll be boring, but we'll that. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, the our, the next is um, something that was brought up in a couple of the meetings and is and is reflected in the RDA staff memo that um, the board when the board considers final uh, the final approval of the final terms the staff would provide a description of benefits to the local economy and potential concerns of the project before final authorization. Um, that's in the staff memo, but it's not necessarily listed in the policy, and so you know. As staff, uh, as staffs change and years go on, sometimes we go back to the policy and we're confused why what we intended isn't there. And so just wanted to know if it was important enough to the board to put in policy or um, just leave it as a sort of staff practice. Board members, uh, would you be in favor of having uh, this practice in the policy rather than just implied so that the expectations are clear and can be applied consistently in the future? Those in favor of that in the policy? Thumbs up, and it is unanimous. Thank you very much. And then a similar question with the pie chart. I think the RDA staff is recommending that they would include the flow chart as an attachment to the policy. This is probably a redundant question then, but uh, if, if the board's in agreement with that, that would mean that if there's any change, you would actually have to amend the policy to change it, but sometimes that formalizes the process itself. So. Well, I, I think it's also helpful for those who are wanting to see how we conduct business to look at that and to have access to that information. So I'm in favor of that. Those in favor of including uh, the flow chart as an attachment to the policy? Thumbs up. Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, this one uh, is sort of really, this is the last one. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this uh, came uh, out of some of the small group meetings and then a um, board member Penfold mentioned it as well. Um, this concept of there's there's quite a bit of public outreach that's done for larger um, community reinvestment areas. And in this case, uh, because it's a single property community reinvestment area, there's not necessarily a role for outreach specifically, um, but there still may be a role for transparency. And so um, I don't know if uh, the board is interested in staff working more with um, RDA staff in terms of what that looks like and what the expectations would be for not necessarily outreach specifically, but just where each, uh, where each piece of information would be sort of made public and how it would be made public and that kind of thing. Yes, and uh, Danny and Jennifer, I think one of the things that's important for us to do as we look at announcing these projects is very clearly communicating how they meet our, our criteria and our goals. And I think that helps us avoid some of the criticism that other municipalities have faced when, when it seems like the dollar amount is out of proportion to the reality of the benefit. And so I, I think... Um, I trust the RDA staff to do a really great job vetting these, and I think we should be really open to um, why these companies are being considered for this because they're meeting our goals, and you've been really clear about that. So I think that needs to be a part of at least the final communication of, of how we are selecting these. Danny, you I, I was just going to add that based on the conversations we had in our small working group, we've started talking internally of not just doing that for these projects, but for all projects, so that you have that transparency and disclosure that as we wrap up projects and finalize it, you have that outline of what that project was, how it met our goals, what the funding was, so that everyone has the same talking points of what the final deal was and, and how it worked. So. Great, Danny. I, I, I think that gets to a lot of the concerns that some of us are facing around feedback mm -hmm. we're getting. I'll, I'll use the the uh, Vivint Home Arena as the most recent example, where there were some real clear public benefits for doing that, and um, a, a relatively low risk. Uh, a proposition on our part, but there was just this perception of public money going to an entity that didn't need public money. And I think we need to get better about articulating why we do that and what situations. So would the board be in favor of encouraging uh, continued exploration <laughs> of doing public outreach on CRAs as well as uh, the other projects we're working on? General. In favor of that? All right, it is unanimous. And Thank to clarify you. that, yes, yeah. that wouldn't require policy update, right? That's just practice, correct? Um, yeah. 
I policy. would, would be worth of course, rather policy. have it in yeah, policy. Yeah, I'd, I'd like it to be in policy. Okay. Yeah. That was what my intention was. So. Madam Chair, yes. I just wanted to say that what we, I think what you mean to articulate and what I want to articulate to constituents is the but for part. Right. The, and be so clear. And you, the flow chart. Um, from the previous, from our work session with the hypothetical situation, was a really great example of the brevity, but the clarity also of this is why we would want to invest here. This is what we capture as a city that we wouldn't otherwise. Just make it so clear for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that gives you some. I think we have a little direction. A little, little, little direction <laughs> for you. Okay, great. And as I mentioned. We will not uh, discuss the land disposition proceeds policy today. That will be on our October agenda. Um, we are now to the point of the report and announcements from our executive director. And I felt to acknowledge the mayor's presence. And now she's, she's not here. David, is there anything um, that she'd like to say? OK. And um, report and announcements from staff. Do I just have, have two, two okay. quick things, if I may. Uh, first and foremost is to update the board that the city has been chosen for the Daniel Rose uh, Land Use Fellowship Program. This is a partnership between the ULI and the National League of Cities. Um, this involves the mayor serving as a honorary fellow as well as assembling a team of three other fellows. Uh, those are city staff members. That is Mike Ackerlow from Community and Neighborhoods as well as Nick Norris from Planning and myself representing the RDA. And we also have a project manager which is the RDA's Amanda Holty who will serve as keeping us all in line and what this is is an opportunity for the city to work with other cities and get peer input and tap into the resources of the uli and the national league of cities and we have chosen a topic that we wish to address and i'm going to read this to make sure i get it right so i have the wording the topic that salt lake city is looking to get assistance on is addressing regulatory barriers in residential zoning districts to increase housing choice and affordability and so that is something that we will work with our uh, other cities. Those are Richmond, Virginia, Columbus, Ohio, and Tucson, Arizona. And we will go to a series of conferences throughout the year and address this, as well as have a conference here in Salt Lake City that if the board wishes to participate, they can. And that will be from March 19th to 22nd. And we will get you more information on that if you are interested in participating. And just the other point I'd make is that all of the costs and traveling is covered by the program. So it's a great opportunity for Salt Lake City to reach out and, and get some input from, from other cities. And then the second point is for Director Mendenhall, um, following up on your request for State Street. And look, <laughs> yes, you, you can thank Madam Chair for reminding us of this, but this is something we have been working on and looking at. We are compiling a list of cities and their streets that would, in our opinion, be similar to what we're trying to do on State Street. And so we're looking at that. We're looking at what those would be and what the priorities are in terms of how they relate to State Street. And then we will come back after the first of the year with that list and try to get input and direction from the board on whether you would actually like to go and schedule some field trips to visit those. So there you go. Just wanted to give you an update on that. Thank that you so much. That is all we have as staff. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I would follow up with that, that we are putting that after the first of the year because it is our policy to follow the federal guidelines that anyone who is not going to be in office next year is not eligible to travel. So that means Stan and I couldn't do that. And well, you can travel on your own, but policy is that. Yeah. And, and that if you are up for reelection, that you also cannot travel. So that would take for several people out of that until um, next year. Stan, so, you so. sound way too giddy. Anytime, anytime that is brought up. That is short timers kicking in, right? So um, we will move to um, the report of the chair and the vice chair, and you just heard that, the explanation of that. Do you have anything, Mr. Vice Chair? Okay, and then we had a written briefing on the status of Regent Street Art Project. Any questions about that? Thank you. That was really great, thorough information. I really appreciated having that. Thanks so much. Well done. And then we also, we have this in a little bit in reverse order. We have Darren Mano, um, who has uh, been, we've nominated to serve on the Redevelopment Advisory Committee. And Darren, are you here? Come have a seat, please. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience that we've kept you um, about 30 minutes longer than we should have. And 
Um, we appreciate your willingness to serve on the rack. If you'll take a minute and tell us why you have an interest to do that, and um, then if there are questions. Sure. Um, I'm an architect, and I'm also a faculty member, adjunct faculty on the School of Architecture and Planning. I teach a class um, where we look at different neighborhoods in the city, and we try and figure out ways, so they're really young students, but we look at ways that the city can develop, and one of the things is State Street that we looked at last year. Um, this year we're looking at the Nine Line Corridor, so from Central Ninth all the way out to Redwood. Um, I'm also on the Ballpark uh, Community Council Board, so I'm involved in the city, I'm from Sandy, and just, I guess, want to do what I can to help the city progress. So you're currently from Sandy? No, I live in the ballpark you, okay. area. Okay, I, I, I was Sandy. like, you, but you go to ballpark, so you <laughs> grew up in Sandy. Okay, questions? Yes, you please, Aaron. Aaron is an awesome community member, and uh, hopefully this is just the beginning of your other public service path in this city. So thank you for being willing to volunteer here. Thanks. With um, boards that the council manages, we interview and then we have a formal meeting and then the formal meeting on the consent agenda, we approve them. But because we don't have, this is our formal meeting and our work session, I'm gonna ask all in favor of supporting this appointment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And with that, we welcome you. And and that's that's certainly a little awkward. I mean, what if it had gone bad poorly? I mean, that's a. <laughs> may want to look at that for the future. But um, I didn't think we could just say the cons we will adopt the consent agenda without talking to to you because we're so happy you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, unless there's anything else, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Madam Chair. Yes. If I could ask council members to stay for just a minute, we just have a quick couple of items in our briefing session that I wanted to capture here and the recorders need a minute just to switch over. So if you could just stay put for a second, it truly will only take a couple of minutes.